Stephen Mosier is up next. But first, more news. The U.S. House of Representatives passed legislation this week calling for a strong response against China's treatment of Uyghur Muslims. By an overwhelming vote, the House approved a bill requiring the administration to toughen its response to China's crackdown on this religious minority. U.N. experts say China's detaining up to a million Uyghurs in mass concentration camps. The bill now goes to the Senate for consideration before Trump can sign it into law. More on this in our next segment. Joining me now with an update on what's really happening in mainland China is the president of the Population Research Institute and author of Bully of Asia, Why China's Dream is the Threat to World Order. Please welcome Steve Mosier from Florida. Steve, thanks for being here. The protests in Hong Kong continue, even All after right. the elections and support from the U.S. Now, you wrote a piece in Breitbart saying that the people of Hong Kong will continue to demand democracy and they'll push against the current leadership, Carrie Lam. Uh, these protests have lasted six months. They've hurt tourism. They've led to the Hong Kong stock market diving, and some have lost their job. Given all of this, can the people of Hong Kong continue this protest? Will they continue? Well, I think they, I think they will. I think they were promised uh, local democracy as kind of their birthright, something they inherited uh, from the Sino-British Agreement signed way back in 1984. Mm -hmm. The Chinese government, what I call the China Party State, the Communist Party State, has torn up the Sino-British Agreement. It tore it up two years ago. By now, the local legislature, Raymond, should be entirely democratically elected. It's not. Mm. And so the Hong Kong Chinese went out and voted, two million of them, 70% uh, of the voting population voted and overturned the communist Chinese control of 17 of the 18 local district councils. This was like in a presidential contest, uh, one candidate winning 48-49 winning of the 50 states. It was mm. a devastating blow to the prestige of the Chinese Communist Party. And I don't mm. think it ends here. I think it begins here. It begins with all of those district councils passing resolutions calling for the resignation of the Hong Kong governor, calling for the Chinese Communist Party to step back and allow local autonomy, uh, calling for the Chinese Communist Party to withdraw its garrison in Hong Kong. I think, I think this is the first chapter of a long book. And what may happen, what may happen is the democratic aspiration of the people in Hong Kong may spread across the border to China. Ah. We may start seeing copycat demonstrations in Guangzhou and Shanghai and Beijing. Uh, this is a real wake-up call for the Chinese Communist Party. They thought they had Hong Kong in the bag. Uh, they were told by Hong Kong's leaders that the silent majority in Hong Kong opposed the demonstrators. Well, guess what? The silent majority came out and voted, and they voted overwhelmingly to support the young mm. demonstrators. Now, uh, the, the House passed and the president signed this Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. Xi, Xi Jinping cannot be happy with that. No, but the people of Hong Kong are very happy. They're waving American flags, singing America the Beautiful, and actually uh, carrying posters with pictures of Donald Trump on it. So we're, we're, we're very, very uh, proud as Americans to stand on the side of freedom and democracy anywhere. And we should be standing with the people of Hong Kong. Uh, they were promised local free elections. They should have those elections. Mm -hmm. What happens now is that if China moves into Hong Kong, and takes control of Hong Kong directly and uses, for example, force to end the demonstrations. We have another Tiananmen massacre. Hong Kong loses its special status. It stops being treated as a de facto separate country, and it becomes part of China. Two trillion dollars disappear overnight. Hong Kong stops being the major financial hub, the major financial center in East and Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. The economic blow of that to China itself would be tremendous. Yeah. And the Chinese leaders who have a lot of their ill-gotten gains stashed in Hong Kong in investments there would lose big time. Wow. Uh, this is all tied to trade. I mean, you referenced it there a moment ago. On Tuesday, during his meeting with the Secretary General of NATO, President Trump was asked when a deal with China might take place. He said this. In some ways, I like the idea of waiting till after the election for the China deal. But they want to make a deal now, and we'll see whether or not the deal is going to be right. It's got to be right. Look, China has been ripping off the United States for many, many years. Mm. Is he smart to delay? Is he smart to delay a deal? 
Well, let, let's let's back up a little bit here and 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 tell tell what really happened this year, which was that in late March the Chinese government backed away from a 150-page single-space trade deal that had been negotiated over the previous year. Right. They tore it up, and they did so because I believe because a week later um, Joe Biden announced that he was running for president, and the Chinese Communist Party thought, oh, Joe's our friend, we're in business mm -hmm. with Hunter Biden, let's now wait out Donald Trump, and mm. we'll wait for President Biden to take office, and then we'll get much better terms. Right. So they walked away from the trade deal, uh, and now they're back to the negotiating table. But I don't believe, Raymond, that they're negotiating in good faith. They're stalling. There are no high-level uh, delegations coming over to the United States. I think that President Trump has figured out uh, the obvious, which is that they're trying to wait him out. They're hoping he won't be reelected in 2020, and they'll get someone in office that uh, is is willing to compromise, is willing to go back to the old status quo, which was that China gets to rip us off and and we don't retaliate in any way. China gets to steal our intellectual property and cheat on trade, and and we simply well, let ourselves be taken well, advantage th of. That economy's so, in trouble. I, Their economy's uh, in trouble. Trump which has is said another reason it, they're probably coming back to the table. Their their economies. Yeah, their economy's in, in really bad shape. Supply chains are relocating to other countries. Uh, their, their exports are down. Uh, their economic growth is slowing. Maybe a negative territory now. We don't know. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you know, the American economy is the envy of the world, and the Chinese economy is, is going in the tank. So time is on our side. And, and I think the president's made it clear that if the China doesn't come to the negotiating table quickly, he'll wait until after the election and get even better terms for the United States for mm. American workers. So yeah. um, I, I like that strategy. Now, moving on to religious freedom and human rights in China, there have been several leaked reports of these detention centers uh, throughout China. Claim, and, and Beijing claims these are vocational training centers. They are, in fact, heavily fortified re-education camps designed to turn Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities into good Chinese citizens who speak Mandarin. Your notions and, and insight on these reports, and what haven't we heard? Well, what haven't we heard is that... Uh we now have 400 pages, roughly, of documents describing how the concentration camps, I mean, re-education camps, yes, but they have, um, you know, hot high walls and, and watchtowers in the corners and guards everywhere. Surveillance cameras are set up so there is not a single blind spot inside the entire prison. So people are, wa are watched when they're going to the bathroom. They're watched when they're in the shower. Um, everybody is under very, very tight control. And the goal of this, uh, network of concentration camps, uh, several hundred in fact, that we've identified by satellite, is to turn the, the Uyghurs and the Kazakhs of western China, what we call western Turkestan, Xinjiang right. in Chinese, into good Chinese, Han Chinese speaking citizens. That means they're required to give up their religious faith. They're not allowed to believe in God. They have to believe in Xi Jinping. Uh, the the church that they're supposed to be worshiping in is the Church of China, uh, not, 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 not the church of their religious faith. They're punished if they speak uh, Uyghur or Kazakh. They must learn to speak fluent Chinese as a condition of being released. Mm. So there are a minimum of one million people in these camps. The camps are hold an average of 5,000 people. Uh, there are 400 we've identified by satellite. So do the, you know, if we do the math, that's, that's, they can hold up to two million uh, and they may be overcrowded. So many of the Uyghur men uh, in their 20s, 30s, 40s, have been taken out of their families and put in these concentration camps. They will not be released ever unless they learn to speak fluent Chinese, quote the sayings of Xi Jinping, and give up their faith. They're forced on Muslim holy days to drink uh, alcohol and eat pork, for example. Wow. So it's, it's brutal mistreatment. It's a mm -hmm. form of cultural genocide. But let's not forget what happens to the women and children when the men are in prison, because the Chinese police who are in Western Turkestan in huge numbers are being billeted with the women and children. Oh. And in fact, they say that the, the, the policemen uh, are, are sleeping in the same beds with the women, but they keep mm. a, a distance of three feet between themselves and the women. Mm. Well, um, you know, believe that if you will. Yeah. But this is, this is worse than cultural genocide. Um, it's, it's the devastation of an entire people. 
Uh, Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party simply want to eliminate the Uyghurs and the Kazakhs uh, from the face of the earth. Now, there are some people in the concentration camps who will never leave because either they refuse to give up their religion or they're sacrificed, they're executed. Hmm. Uh, we know that most of the organs that are used in forced organ transplantation in China come from Western Turkestan. We know that in the airports in Western Turkestan, there are express lanes for the doctors who are carrying out the harvested lungs and kidneys hmm. and hearts uh, through the airport security lines onto the plane to get them to hospitals where they can be transplanted. Uh, this is forced organ transplantation. It's big business in China. And don't forget, everybody in Western Turkestan, 20, 25, 30 million people have had their DNA collected and their DNA has been analyzed so they can find out in an instant who's a tissue match for someone in Shanghai Awful. or Beijing willing to pay big bucks wicked. for, say, a heart or a liver. Wicked, wicked stuff. I, I want to turn for a moment. I only have about three minutes, Steve, to the Catholic Church in China. Uh, as we know, there was this Vatican-China deal signed in September of 2018. Details are still on known. Now, prior to the signing of the agreement, Pope Francis reportedly asked Bishop Vincent Gao, who was recognized by the Vatican and a member of the underground church, to sacrifice his position in the order, uh, in order, rather, to formally excommunicate Bishop Zahn so that this bishop could take his place. This was an effort to promote unity. Gao agreed and stepped down to become Zahn's auxiliary. Now Bishop Gao's on the run. What happened? Well, what happened is the diocese was turned upside down. Uh, originally, there were 80, 90,000 people in the underground church and about 10,000 in the patriotic church. Bishop Gua, in obedience to Pope Francis, stepped down, agreed to become the auxiliary. But then the con Communist Party officials came to him and said, that's not enough. You have to sign an agreement acknowledging that you're a member of the Chinese mm. Patriotic Catholic Church. And that he refused to do because the Catholic Patriotic Church in China is a schismatic organization that takes direction not from the magisterium but from the Chinese Communist Party. They've been persecuting this poor man for a year and he's now on the run. He managed to escape his captors but uh, who knows how long he can stay underground. But there's, there's a heartbreaking statement that he made that, that people need to hear. Mm -hmm. Bishop Gua said, before the signing of the agreement we remain fearless and maintain the faith no matter how much we were persecuted because the Holy See supported us. Now, he said, we're really helpless. To be frank, um, whoever refuses to sign the agreement will suffer greater persecution from the Chinese Communist Party. It's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Retired Hong Kong Cardinal Joseph Zen, who's obviously been very vocal about his disapproval of this Vatican-China agreement, uh, in an interview this week, he said that of the Vatican Secretary of State, Cardinal Perolin, who authored the Chinese-Vatican agreement, it's a real mystery how a man of the church, given all his knowledge of China, of the communists, could do such a thing as he's doing now. The only explanation is not faith. It's a diplomatic success, vainglory. Of Pope Francis' approach to China, he says that he has low respect for his predecessors. He's shutting down everything done by John Paul II and Pope Benedict. Your reaction, Steve Mosier? Well, I think Bishop Zen, who knows China better than anyone else because he's one of only two Chinese cardinals, three Chinese cardinals in the whole world, uh, should have been consulted before the Sino-Vatican agreement was signed, uh, he, and his advice should have been followed. And the pastoral guidelines that were issued last June are a disaster mm -hmm. because they're unsigned. No one knows who wrote them, although we think they were a product of Cardinal Perlin. And they basically tell Chinese priests and, and Chinese bishops, like good Bishop Gua that we were just talking about, that if they come to you and want you to sign an agreement joining the Patriotic Church, uh, call in witnesses and say to witnesses that you're signing under protest. Well, that won't be allowed. Mm. And the pastoral guidelines then say, well, if they don't allow you to call in witnesses, write an addendum on the bottom of the official document saying you disagree with the provision of joining the, the patriotic church. That won't be allowed either. The guidelines are totally useless in mm. dealing with the real situation in China. Now, now, Raymond, I don't understand why, if the Vatican wanted the 
Chinese Catholics who've been faithful members of the church for decades and suffered persecution mm -hmm. to join the Patriotic Church. Why not just issue a general dispensation saying, uh, we understand that you're under tremendous pressure and right. persecution. Go ahead and sign the agreement, make a mental reservation. You have a general dispensation to do that. But these guidelines don't do that. These guidelines are so vague and confusing that people like Bishop Gaw really don't know what to do. Uh, a, a Chinese bishop has come out and said that Catholics in the country must put their loyalty to the state before the faith. Bishop John Fang Xiao uh, had this to say at a communist-sponsored meeting last week. He said, love of homeland must be greater than the love for the church, and the law of the country is above canon law. Why are we not hearing, hearing anything from the Vatican, uh, given this rhetoric, Steve? Well, this turns, uh, you know, the faith on its head, doesn't it? Because we're to be, we're to be faithful to God first, and and then to be be good Americans or good Chinese second. Mm -hmm. um, but this has been said by by many of the patriotic bishops. Bishop Fang, mm -hmm. another bishop in China, who's a member of the Patriotic Church and also a member of the National People's Congress, so he's on very good right. terms with the Communist Party, has said exactly the same thing. We are to be good Chinese first. We are to be good socialists first, and then we can be Catholic. Well, that's not that's not the proper order no. of things, is it? Well, we will leave it there. Stephen Mosher, thank you for your insight as always, and we look forward to having you again. Bully of Asia, Why China's Dream is the New Threat to the World Order by Stephen Mosher is available at bookstores everywhere and online. Thank you again.